I want to welcome you to our part four of our Ruth devotional today. We are moving through different habits to help us quit quitting. Our first habit that we learned how to do was to move through accepting the assignment of refinement. And the last time we talked about how to continue following through despite how we feel. Today, we're going to talk about staying open to the movement of God. Now, I don't know about you. I have a daughter who's about eight months old, and I am slowly learning that my life is not my own. <laughs> she has her own movements, her own methods, her own ways. And I am just learning to be patient and back way up and follow her lead. It's a new way for me to move. I'm so used to leading from the front and I'm learning how to lead from the back. And it's a powerful way to teach me also how to be open to God's movement too. When things are outside of our control, when things are outside of our understanding, a lot of times we seek to grab control even more. We seek to uh, fix things around us, or we will try to organize and order things to make us feel a little bit more in control. Instead, we are going to take a look at what does it look like to be open to God working in our midst in a greater way, in a bigger way, that he is leading and we are following. So let's take a look today by reading our scripture, Ruth 2, 15 through 23. Ruth 2, 15 through 23. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men. Even if she gathers among the sheaves, don't embarrass her. Rather, pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up. And don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleans in the field until evening. And then she threshed the barley she had gathered and it amounted to an ephah. She carried it back to town and her mother-in-law soon saw how much she had gathered. Ruth brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. Her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our kinsmen redeemers. Then Ruth, the Moabitess, said, he even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with his girls because in someone else's field, you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the servant girls of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished. And she lived with her mother-in-law there. Friends, that's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I have a question for you today to begin our time. And I'm wondering, who are the people that you go to when you feel like life is out of control? Or where is the place that you go to? I have a particular park that overlooks a waterway. And when I'm there, I feel the peace of God. I don't understand why but it's my place I go to when I am having one of my hard days. When I'm having one of those moments that I just can't understand, sometimes I go to my friend Carol or my husband. I feel safe there. I know that they help me make sense out of this crazy world. And a lot of times I run to the Psalms. They just have a way of expressing what I'm feeling. What are the places that you go to? Who are the people that you go to when life feels out of control? When the day is so hard, you just don't know where to go. When you get that diagnosis from the doctor, when you get that call from a friend that results in loss, where do you run to? You know, there's a part of us that 
reacts a lot of times to this out of controlness. A lot of times when we are having our own reactions, we're operating out of anxiety, out of fear, instead of patience and understanding. Ruth in this passage has been following Naomi almost blindly, we would say. It's blind trust, blind faith. And yet that's what we are called to with God. She doesn't know where she's going. She's the foreigner. She doesn't know the land she'll end up in. But she somehow trusts that something greater is at work here. She stays with a mother-in-law who is in massive self-pity and discouragement and even calls herself bitter. She stays with her, trusting that something greater is happening at work here. She doesn't even know God, and yet she has greater faith than Naomi. It's fascinating to watch here as she goes to Boaz field and she gleans in it and Boaz takes notice of her. And not only does he take notice, he provides safety for her. He provides a refuge. He provides the place that God says he is for us. In what ways in your life have you ever provided refuge for another person? It may not even be taking them into your home, but in some way you have provided them safety. You've provided them a place to rest where they know that they won't be harmed. That's part of being and living out God's character, just the way he is for us. Our quick quitting verse today comes from James chapter 4, verse 8. It says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. How close do you feel to God today? Do you feel like I'm super close? I've never been this close to God before. Are you feeling pretty far away today? Like you can't even begin to think about connecting with God. Or are you somewhere in the middle where you wish you might feel a little bit closer? You know, to stay open to God's movement, to stay open to his working in our midst, it's going to mean a bit of constant change that you don't get to control. And if there's anything that we can learn about this, while there is constant change, there is a consistent pattern to how God moves. And if you want to discover that pattern, you find it in his character. You find it in who God is. We know that God is good. We know that he is kind. We know that he is a caring God who provides refuge. We know that he is full of wisdom. We know that he has abundance to give to us. We know that he's keeping watch over us everywhere. Where in your life have you seen God moving lately? Where have you seen the goodness, the kindness? Where have you seen the wisdom? Where have you seen his character moving in your midst? Sometimes the best thing for us to do is to step back from a situation, stand back and look for God. One of the wisest things I was ever taught as a pastor is to not react out of my own anxiety. That when you are in relationship with many people, you will constantly want to jump when somebody says they're hurting, you're gonna to want to jump to heal them or fix that. When somebody says they need help, you're going to have a natural urge to jump and want to help them, but you can't be everything for everyone. Somewhere in there, you have to let God move. And so one of the very first ways I learned to do that was to not react, but to step back and leave a lot of room for God in the midst of relationships. Step back and instead of reacting out of my own anger or my own hunger or my own thirst or my own anxiety, I step back and I watch and I ask, God, what are you doing in the middle of this? And how can I align with you in that? Two really powerful questions. If you can discipline yourself in this, and believe me, it takes practice and I am still practicing. <laughs> But if you can ask those questions, God, okay, what are you doing and how can I align with you in this? You can begin to look for his character in the midst. You can begin to pray over the situation first 
rather than jumping in with your own agenda. And by doing that, we allow a lot of room for the Holy Spirit to move with people. Allow the Holy Spirit to move with a lot of relationships. We trust God. It's an act of faithfulness and trust to know that God is going to do the things he said he's going to do and that he is keeping watch and he knows what's best in this situation. So what do you do when you don't know what God is doing? When you've backed up and you've asked those two questions, but you just, you can't see God in your midst and you don't know what he's doing. You know, that's the time when we often go to people that we trust, people that have become wise, discerning people around us that we can just collapse into and say, here's my situation. What do you see around it? We bring the people of wisdom and discernment. I think it's interesting here that this is a moment where Naomi has her turnaround. Up to this point, Naomi has been completely bitter and completely uh, untrusting of God. She feels like God has left her, abandoned her, failed her. She is in her own misery. And in this moment when Ruth comes home and she says, she, she shows all the barley that she's got in that day and she shows the abundance, Naomi is like, where did this come from? How did this happen? And when Ruth begins to tell her in that moment, Naomi says, I get it now. I see. I see. Naomi wasn't able to see God on her own. She wasn't able to back up out of her own situation and see God at work. But when Ruth comes home and shows her the abundance, which Naomi recognizes as the character of God, God is an abundant God. When Ruth comes home and shows that she was protected and she was kept safe, Naomi says, I see, I get it now. She sees God at work in their midst. And her reaction is, the Lord bless him. He is one of our kinsmen redeemers. And she begins to see how God is going to redeem this situation. Have you ever had a situation in your life that has brought incredible wounding or incredible loss, and you just don't understand the purpose to it. You don't understand why it had to happen that way. And then somewhere down the road, God redeems it. Maybe he uses you in a way to speak encouragement into someone else who is going through the very same event that you did. Or maybe God uses you to help teach someone not to make the same choices you did. Somehow God redeems that wound and that horrible event into something that births life for another. It's a powerful phrase to be called a kinsman redeemer. In the Jewish law, when a man died, the wife could marry another in the, other, in the family, a brother, a cousin, um, one that was related to the husband. That's how they handled the widows at that time. And that was so that the widows were not abandoned in the society. And so they had someone who was watching and providing and taking care of them. They had a house, a place where they belonged. And while that may not be the way we have our society today, that is the way they structured it then. And so Boaz is a relative of Elimelech. And he is actually someone that is, has the ability to say, I will take a wife or I will take one of the daughters, or I will take one of the daughter-in-laws of Elimelech. And that's powerful because it takes this abandonment, this destitute living that Naomi and Ruth were in, and it actually redeems all the loss, all the grief that they had. And he, they now have a place, they now have a place where they belong. This is pretty powerful for all of us. I think we're all longing for a place to belong in our lives. We're longing to have a place of safety and refuge. But a lot of times we're not sure that we deserve it. We're not sure that we're worthy of it. We remember our sin. We remember the bad choices that we've made in life, and we judge ourselves on those. And a lot of times when God is in our midst and he's moving amongst us and he's offering us good things, we recoil because we don't feel worthy. So I have a second quick quitting verse for you today. It's Psalm 103, 
12, Psalm 103, 12. It says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Perhaps one of the best parts of God's character is that he doesn't remember our sin because he redeemed it. He doesn't recount it. He doesn't remember it. He casts it off and he remembers it no more. When he looks at us, what he sees is his son who is wholly worthy. When he looks at you and I, he sees the character of his son, Jesus. He sees his blood sacrificed for you and I. What do you do when you remember those embarrassing moments? What do you do when they come up in your mind or you remember the bad choices that you've made? How do you handle it? Are you a person who laughs them off? Are you a person who tries to cover it up? Uh, do you become numb and you start to feel awful? Or do you have a good balance of letting your mistakes develop you but not ruin you? If I'm being truthful, I tend to beat myself up for my bad choices or my mistakes. I have a lot of negative self-talk sometimes that I have to watch and I have to try and discipline in my life. It is definitely one of the areas God is working with me on. You know, God says, that's not who I am. That's not the way I treat my children. That's not the way I want you to treat yourself. If I remember your sin no more, neither should you. Learn from it, gain wisdom, gain discernment from it, but stop beating yourself up because of it. Now, Naomi, she's been in a place of misery. She's made a poor choice in how she has chosen to see this whole um, journey that she has been on with Ruth. But in the moment where she begins to see God moving, she shakes off the dust. She shakes off the bitterness. She shakes off her bad choices. She says, I see God moving. I see him in the midst. Now I get the plan. Let's go. And from that moment on, Naomi becomes the big encourager towards Ruth and Boaz. She becomes the one who is jubilant and joyful and moving with God in this. Where do you see God working in your midst? Now, I want you to be careful today, and I want you to acknowledge the we have excuses. When God is moving in our midst, sometimes we'll say things like, well, I didn't know. Or God will bring something to us, an opportunity to us to serve, an opportunity to help another, an opportunity to redeem a wound in our life. And we'll say, oh, there's not enough time. There's not enough resources. I have to get things done at home. We have all these excuses. But there is no excuse in this moment when God is on the move and offering us a chance to take our lives back and offering us a chance to redeem our misery, our bitterness, our wounds, our anger, our negativity, our bad choices, our sin. Today, God is moving in your midst. He's going to be offering you opportunities. He's going to be offering all of us chances to redeem these things. How will you step into that? How will you prepare yourself to quit quitting just because you don't see the plan, just because we don't understand the plan? Let's move forward today in encouragement with God. We all know somebody who's struggling with negativity and not being able to see the blessings in their midst. And I want you to come alongside those people. I want you to pray for them. I want you to ask God what he's doing and how you can align with that and how you might be a part of the redemption process for them and for yourself. Thanks for being with me today. I look forward to seeing you again. Take care and blessings.